Welcome to another edition of Pod Jerky. I'm your host, Tom, and today I am joined by actor, director, singer, a man of all talents, Adam Bush. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. So I'm going to start off with something I kind of start off, I guess, in this world now as we live today. How's COVID treating you? Oh, better and better every day. Um, it's tough. I, it, I wish um, I wish we could get our, ourselves together and just do the full quarantine and move on. I think it's very difficult, the half quarantine and then the quarter quarantine and the partial and then the calling it off and then the going back. There was that moment when quarantine was first ordered in America and you felt that real um, excitement of we were all going to do this together. And it was exciting to be a part of something. And if my civic duty is to sit at home, I'm super into that because I can, I'm very good at that. And I'm definitely one of those people who felt like, oh, this is where my superpowers will come in. My ability to be by myself and not get lonely and to uh, shut in will now be a superpower. And it felt like it for a little bit, and then everything just got fractured and loosened and different, and now it just feels like this weird, crazy in-between thing. I went for a drive today, and I was in downtown Los Angeles, and there was a line for testing that just went around the block at this place, and it was such a weird post-apocalyptic sight, you know, of just Americans in Christmas time lined up with their masks not six feet apart. So you're looking at people huddled together with masks on, which just is so counterintuitive when you look at it as a visual statement. It's like, what are we supposed to be doing? Not breathing each other's air, but huddled close together. And it's just a weird time to be alive. How is yours going? Well, we just actually went into full lockdown as of today. They just made the announcement today. And we are going into full lockdown as of Boxing Day, which is the 26th. Uh, you guys don't have Boxing Day over there in the States. We do uh, We have it over here in Canada, which is the day after Christmas. And we're going into full lockdown, which means everything is closed. Uh, we did this back in March. And our numbers got down to, in my province alone in Ontario, uh, we got down to about 70 cases a day. And that was really good. And we are up to 2,400 cases a day right now in our province. Uh, so they have to lock it down and uh, it sucks for business, but unfortunately that's just the road we have to take right now. It's just, uh, it, it's a mess. Now, is it true that you guys are getting like two grand a month or got two grand a month? Yeah, we have 2,400 cases uh, as our highest right now. Uh, we had 2,100 today, uh, which was a little lower than the 24 that we had uh, two days ago. Um, but it, it's Christmas time too, and people are going to start getting together. And I, I think that the numbers are just going to explode. Is it also true that you guys were given um, like two thousand dollars a month cash? No. Uh, yeah. A month? Okay. No. No. So what it was is we were we had the Canadian Emergency Fund, and we were given money. You could apply for it. Not everybody applied for it, but you could apply for it if you weren't working. And that would help you out is almost like an unemployment. Uh, if you were laid off from your job, if you were, uh, if your place had closed or whatever it was, it was two grand a month. And uh, people were using that because they had no other means of working or getting any money to pay the rent or their groceries or whatever it was. So we did have an emergency fund, yes. And it was two grand a month for how long? Uh, that lasted up until I believe September from March. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We had yeah. a so a lot of people did take here. advantage of that. Yeah. It was an American relief fund, but it consisted of like a Tootsie Roll, a stick of beef jerky, and half a roll of toilet paper. And that was supposed to, and I'm pretty much down to the end of the roll of toilet paper. So I don't know where we go from here. Yeah. It, it, it got uh, a little bit crazy here uh, with even with the toilet paper. You couldn't even find toilet paper here. Uh, people were just hoarding it like crazy. Like we were going into some like nuclear war or something like that. And uh, we had to be told to stop because it was just insane and how how many people hoarded the toilet paper. But yeah, I mean, Canada's done pretty well considering uh, what's going on. However, there are things that I think they could have done a lot better to fix the situation and they're just not doing it until right now. 
what's the biggest example of that? So I, I kind of disagreed with them reopening the schools. Uh, I work in the school, uh, but you know, you're, you're pretty much telling me that I'm not allowed to go see my family for Christmas, but I'm allowed to be in a classroom full of 15 kids. So I can see everybody else's family, but I can't see my own. We're basically locked into our own houses during the Christmas holidays. Uh, there are penalties and it's not a fine anymore. It's actually a court date and you will be prosecuted for this right now. This just came out today. We have uh, mandatory uh, curfews as well. So it, it's just kind of turned into a mess. Like they closed down the little shops, uh, like the mom and pop stores in our province and in our city where they allowed the big box stores to be open. And all that does is funnel everybody into the big box stores. And it just creates more chance of a spread. So there was a lot more that I thought that they could have done. But, you know, they, they waited and it got too big. And now they're panicking. Yeah, that does seem really counterintuitive. Yeah. But just so you know, we Americans look to Canada and pretty much everywhere else in the world right now with um, admiration and awe. And we wish we could be handling things in a similar fashion, but we're not. Yeah, it's interesting because we always look at it and I'll watch the sports highlights every morning and I'll see like college football games and there's multiple fans in the stands and they're not wearing masks and they're in big groups of people, not six feet apart. It, 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 it's just really, really weird to see that when we know it for our sporting events, there are zero fans. There are no fans allowed whatsoever. So I don't know what the difference is in the doctors coming up with their... I guess their answer to how to stop this. Do we all just do like the herd immunity thing or do we just close it all down? There can't be a middle ground there. There can't be because it's got to be one way or the other. There's no middle ground with this stuff. That's not how you cure a pandemic. Right. By compromising and appeasing all sides. There's one scientific way to do it and that's it. Yeah. And we're yeah, not definitely. doing it here. <laughs> we're no. definitely not doing it here. It's yeah, crazy. your numbers are crazy. Yeah, your it's numbers are really, wild, really bad. Right? Yeah. And we have a president who won't even comment on it anymore. He's very busy, very distracted yeah. by other things. Oh, yes, he is. Yeah. We, we see it every day. We see it on the news every day. And I'm like, frankly, I'm tired of it. I don't even watch the news anymore because it's COVID or the Trump-Biden thing. And it's like, I don't care about the news anymore. I was traveling around the world when George W. Bush was president. And I remember getting the advice at an airport and then following it that somebody was like, you should put a, a Canadian flag on your backpack because that'll just help you out a lot when you try and go around. And I did, and they were right. And I don't know what I would put on my bag if I was traveling around the world right now because we're just not representing in a very exciting fashion at all. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Yeah, the, you can't even have a flag. We actually suspended all flights from the UK today. Um, because there's a new strain of COVID that is extremely dangerous that is in the UK. And they suspended all flights from the UK, so nothing can come in here right now. I'm glad I didn't have any international travel planned until April. Yeah, we're not allowed to leave any. Well, we are, but we're not. But I mean, I wouldn't even take that chance. I have some health issues that I don't really want to take that chance with. So uh, we're going to try and stay as safe as we can. But uh, hopefully this goes away soon. Hopefully we get a chance to get back to somewhat of a normal life, not having to wear the mask, not having to keep you know distance from people, being able to see your friends even. I mean, my wife works from home all day. She doesn't get to see anybody really except me. You know, she's starting to get tired of me. And uh, she, she just wants to go out and see people. And, it, it, and I, can, I can understand how it can get depressing and how it can get uh, very upsetting to just have to stay home and do nothing all day, every day for her, uh, when she's a social person. It's a lot of people are turning into what my writer friends are like. A lot of my writer friends that I would visit after they'd been kind of holed up writing all day and they look at you like, where did you come from? Another person? What are you doing here? What planet are you from? And I feel like it's like that with everybody. We're all just becoming very feral <laughs> and yeah. I've lost most of my, um, social ability when my only social interactions consist on zoom and skype and podcasts i've yeah. stopped learning how to talk like a normal person but i know how to take a commercial break very well 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, because of the podcast, it's kept me actually very busy and it's allowed me to do certain things. And, you know, we ran this convention and it, it was a lot of work to put into this whole convention. It was a weekend convention. And you actually were nice enough to join us on our opener of the convention. We reached out to you and you said, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. And we really appreciated you for coming on. And, and I know um, Sarah and uh, Trish the Dish that were both on there uh, on the opener both were super excited that you were coming on. Trish said she was in awe uh, when you did come on because we actually didn't even tell her it was just myself, Sarah and Russ that knew that you were coming on. And Trish was very excited. And when I told Sarah about it, Sarah was like, oh my God, I loved him in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He was the best. I really, really liked him. So she goes, that's amazing. So they they popped pretty hard for that. That was a lot of fun. It was a uh, it was a fun round table experience where all you guys were there and we were all mic'd up and we could just have all these cross conversations and celebrate yeah. the uh, the joy of podcasting and get to know each other. Yeah. And it, and it keeps us busy. I mean, uh, doing this podcast convention, it was a full I think it was 51 hours straight that we did. And I ended up going on 13 of those hours. Wow. And uh, was on 13 different shows that I was uh, trying to help out with and trying to uh, do round tables with and all that open close. So mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of fun, but you get tired, but it keeps you busy. And it was something that kept me distracted during this whole time of COVID. Otherwise, I would be at home on the couch, nothing to do. I'd walk my dogs and then I'd watch TV all day. So it kept me busy. So it's 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 actually become really, really fun. It was great. There was one guy who was on there with us and everyone was stationary in their little pod and he was at one location and then driving and then in traffic and then made it to another location and then came out and then set up and we got to follow his whole journey in that little zoom box and it was nice to think we were spending the day together as he's running errands putting on a festival meeting with us and getting to see all these different locations with him as we went along what kind of dogs do you yeah, have i have a uh, maltese terrier and i have a golden retriever puppy oh nice yeah. So the puppy keeps me uh, very, very active because she is very uh, hyper, I would say. So lots of walks and uh, she keeps you busy. Uh, as soon as you go on a Zoom call, and this is why I do this in the basement, but as soon as you go on a Zoom call or you go on a, a podcast on a video, she's right in your face and she's mm -hmm. jumping up on your lap and she's licking your face and she's knocking the mic over. And it's like she knows. She's like, I want to be on camera too. So it actually uh, is pretty funny. My wife hates it. She loves the dog, but she hates it because she's at work and is trying to be professional. And she was just trying to sit downstairs with them and they were all over the place. So she's like, I can't do this. I have to go upstairs to the office. I have a similar um, situation with my dog whenever I have to, because we do a lot of self-recording here now and a lot of uh, self-tapes and audio and it's the same bit. The sec as soon as you, you put all your focus onto a microphone or a screen, your dog's like, why aren't you focusing on me? I would like to take the place of that screen. How can we make that happen as quickly as possible? So I have a whole routine I do where I satiate the dog, take off the collar and put them to bed before I can even speak into a microphone. It yeah. seems to be working yeah. all right right now. Yeah, seems to be uh, the thing to do. I mean, they they love the attention and I don't blame them. I mean, they're, they're home all day, especially when uh, we were at work all day long. Uh, now that uh, the COVID has happened and we're always home, they got used to that. And oh, now yeah. they think that it's every day that we're always here. And I was like, it's going to be a shock for them once we go actually go back to work. I've been back to work since September because I do work in the schools and the schools open. And uh, my wife has stayed home since March. So, I mean, she's still not going back. And they said in, it's probably going to be maybe March when they go back, but not even sure about that. Yeah, every time they set a date here for schools to go back, it keeps getting kicked further down the line. What grade do you So teach? our school's out right now? They just started uh, Christmas break, and then they come back in January. Yeah. So I'm, I actually work with special needs kids. Uh, so I'm not actually a, a teacher in a, in a classroom. I work with uh, special needs kids in like three different classrooms in a high school. Uh, so it's uh, very, very different for me. My parents were both teachers growing up. So I have a lot of sympathy for what you do. Yeah, it can be tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you were just talking about doing some uh, like pre-recorded videos. And when we were doing the convention, we actually um, at first reached out to you just to get a uh, like a holiday shout out, holiday greeting. Uh, and you sent forward a video um, talking about anxiety. And then you, I saw you had posted on your Instagram as well. And you were talking about doing the... Um, 
when you when you got your anxiety when you were a kid, you couldn't sleep. You had insomnia. And uh, you were talking about this whole thing. And then your daughter got it. And then you had a nice message at the end of it. I don't know if you remember that video uh, or not. But if uh, you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, the sentiment is that of Zay Franks and the human test. And he has this thing called the human test that we take to decide if we're human or not. And he came to this hypothesis that I enjoy a lot and try and um, internalize and share with everyone I can, which is that the things that make us feel the most isolated and separate and alone are in fact the things that connect us to each other and bring us all together and as a as a rule whatever it is in your mind that thing that you're most ashamed of most embarrassed about or the thing that just makes you feel the most isolated and separate from people if you were to express it is actually the thing that would bring you closer to everyone because if you're being specific about it anything you do that's weird uh, uh, um, I take pieces of paper while I'm talking and I roll them into tiny little balls and I can't stop doing it. And while other people are talking, I'm just rolling these little roly polies and setting them up on a table. And that's a really weird thing that makes me feel very strange and different from everyone else. But if I were to say it out loud, I know right now someone listening is going, oh, I do the exact same thing when I'm talking to other people. I take pieces of paper and roll them up into little balls and sit them up. So whatever it is that makes you feel like a weirdo is actually making me feel much closer to you right now in this moment. And I think whatever I expressed to you was just a, a further example of that. And I think podcasts are a great um, example of that because the more specific you are about your podcast, if you're like, this is a podcast for people who rip pieces of paper and roll them into tiny balls with an OCD kind of obsession while people are talking, that a million other people are going to go, oh, I need to listen to that podcast because I do the exact same thing. So I think that's what you're speaking on and you asked for some kind of holiday message and that was the only holiday message I could come up with that was non-denominational. Yeah, no. And, and we, uh, we had watched the video and we're like, you know what, this is actually a perfect video, uh, that he sent forward because we were talking about everybody in our group and having that togetherness feel. And, you know, we, we made a video that took us a couple months to make only because it took everyone so long to bring in their submissions, but we had videos of people saying, so each podcast would have their own line and they would say, you know, if you are ever in need, we are there. If you ever feel down, we are there. And, and that kind of just summed up what the group was all about and just bringing people together and being there for each other and uh, being able to speak on each other. And what you said was perfect. And it just kind of fit in with everything there. I'm so glad because I think a lot of us creative types feel the same way. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. So I want to get a little bit into your career, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about your music first or if you want to talk about your um, acting first. I know you started off with a band. So let's start off with the music. Um, what got you into the music? Well, my father taught piano and was an earth science teacher. And he um, taught earth science at a school, Russell Sage Junior High School in Queens, New York, very close to where um, Donald Trump was born and where Simon and Garfunkel are from in Forest Hills, Queens. Now, his school did not have a music department, but they put on a musical every year. And he was the director of the band for the musicals, but there was no band because there was no music department. So what he would do is bring in... Uh, me and my brothers, and we would be the band. So school was very important to my parents because they were both teachers. I went to school in Long Island. He taught in Queens. And I would only get off school once a year, and that was the day of the rehearsal for the musical where I would go to my father's school. I would play the saxophone. My older brother would play the drums. My younger brother would play the bass. And we were the house band for these musicals. And we'd do a different musical every year. And that kind of started... Um, me being interested in music because my older brother was a drummer. I had a rock drum kit in the house. And so as soon as I got to junior high school, I found other people that made music and I became the drummer in bands and we just always made music. And it's always something that I loved and felt very close to. And certainly, um, as I became an actor, cause I started doing that young too. It was nice to have the balance. It was nice to have something to do 
when you weren't working or when you were searching for jobs. It was great to go on the road and tour and make music. And I got to work with a lot of artists that I looked up to growing up. And that's a very satisfying thing. And do you still do the music? I do. I do. I still um, produce records for other people. And I still write a lot of songs and put a lot of songs in TV and films and commercials and things like that. Um, I've been working a lot with this folk artist named Dan Byrne. And you can catch all his stuff online and uh, see a bunch of records I made with him that are out now. Yeah, I'm working with a, a Canadian artist here, a hip hop artist. And he has a whole new platform. He just got named the president of EB, uh, EBMG for Canada. And uh, I'm doing a little bit of work with him right now, which is very interesting. And he's got a new single coming out on Wednesday. Today's the 21st. Yeah, so two more days from now. He's got a new single coming out and they got this whole new platform started. It's going to be really, really cool uh, that they're getting some artists that are coming into there. And it's not just about hip hop. It's about all music genres. And uh, it's just been a really, really cool ride. It's been a, like a really, really busy just working up to it. Uh, so I can see what you go through with music and your traveling and all that stuff. I did nothing near that. And just the stuff that I'm doing behind the scenes is a lot of work. Is this hip hop? Yeah. I hear a lot of hip hop on your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, these artists, they're called the squad. Um, they're Canadian artists and they're actually from around 30 years. This guy has been in the game. His name's thrust. He's been around uh, 30 years and, uh, we grew up listening to him and I just made the connection through Instagram with him. And I said to him, Hey, can we use one of your songs or a couple of your songs in our podcast, just as we're doing a review? And I wanted to do it the right way. Cause a lot of people will just go and take stuff and not ask permission or whatever it is. And I wanted to ask permission. I wanted to do it the right way. So we asked him. He was like, yeah, cool. No problem. So we did it. And then he just reached out to me and said, hey, uh, thanks for like doing this and doing that. And then we just kind of struck up a friendship. And like now we talk almost daily. And I'm like, this this is a guy I grew up listening to. Like, this is really, really cool that we can actually have a friendship over this. And he has this whole project he's working on and he got us involved. And it's just, it's just been phenomenal. It's just been, it, you didn't think when you started a podcast and we've been around for about eight months now, uh, that this was going to happen. This is what it was going to turn into. And, and it's just been really cool. What capacity are you working with thrust? So right now I'm doing a lot of the promo work for him. Um, we do some videos, we do, uh, some, uh, images and stuff like that. Uh, we were invited over to, go and shoot with the video when they shot the video. But because of COVID, I kind of said, you know, I'm going to take a step back just because I, my health issues and I didn't, uh, didn't want to go around a lot of people. Uh, he said, that's totally cool. Um, but there are some announcements coming up that I can't even say that we're involved with as well. Um, that actually is going to turn out really, really well for us. And I, and I had no idea that this was going to happen. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Whatever it may be. Yeah, I it's, like hearing it's exciting be a fun things ride. happening to musicians at this time because it's a really tough time for musicians right now. It is. Well, even with the COVID thing now, like what do you find uh, with either music or with acting, uh, whatever it is, has that put a halt to everything? Uh, like from us on our standpoint, looking at it, we look at it as, hey, look what's on TV tonight. We don't know kind of the workarounds behind the scenes. What do you see as like the industry wide what's happening with COVID? I think things are starting to pick up now. They're starting to learn how to produce with this new normal and also um, how to afford it because it's not like a show will now be given a COVID budget. There is no um, Hollywood emergency COVID fund. So right. it's just the cost of making your thing is now double. But your budget is the same. So what are you going to do? Can you afford to continue? Do you make cuts? Do you find a way around it? Or do you just wait? And everyone's figuring that out right now. There's degrees of this that are... Will... There are changes that will stay with production forever for the better that should have been there in terms of safety and privacy and autonomy. And there are other things that will never be the way they were. And everyone's trying to figure it out now. I'm optimistic that with the vaccine, things will 
start to uh, progress in a better fashion, but it's it was been really rough. I mean, theater has been done, Broadway has been done, live music is done, and I don't know how they're going to recover. I really don't. Like it was just you know anyone to break it down to a real simple thing. Anyone that owns a restaurant knows the cost of adding live music or theater into your business. And it is very expensive and very hard to turn a profit. And now that it's been removed completely, how it's going to come back, I'm really not sure. Even if you're a success, the money is so tight. And it's always a labor of love to just keep going and filling the seats and keep the production going. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. Live music is going to change in a drastic way, and so is theater. And I don't know how or when it recovers, because even... Whatever date you can set in your mind for restaurants to be back open for business, for good, for real, theater and concerts are two years from whatever that date is. And I don't know how they continue to survive. Even the successful bands I know who do really well on the road and have enough to keep their employees on salary are just about running out of bread right now. And this What do you think? Do you think that it goes to like a streaming service more for uh, live concerts? Like, you know, like Hamilton will be live on the Disney um, channel, the Disney uh, app that they have, Disney Plus, whatever it's called. Um, They'll have like different uh, Christmas runs right now that are just going virtual. And I think that might be where it's got ahead. It's so weird because I have and this is probably just my own prejudice. But when I hear about blockbusters making their premiere on a tv screen i'm like great we all win but when it's theater i'm like that's sacrilegious you can't do that you need to see it in a theater or if it's a live music performance like it's not the same you have to be there but for blockbusters i'm comfortable with it and i know there are plenty of uh cinema techs who will say how dare you it is not the same on a small screen that it isn't on a big screen and they're right they are right i don't know when it i don't know when it all settles i don't know what the future is going to hold i really don't I wish I could say. Yeah, it's going to be interesting anyways. I mean, it's it's really hard to say. Like you said, it's just it's it's tough to say how this will end up. Hopefully we get to go back out to see like Broadway plays again. Uh, we've seen quite a few um, over our years, uh, go, like that I was married with my wife. And, you know, you we enjoy favorites? going to the theater. Uh, you know, we watched... Uh, I, like I've seen pretty much all of the the, the ones from uh, back in the day. So I saw Mamma Mia, I saw Lion King. Um, there was another one. I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't the um, the, the Newfoundland one, uh, Far From Home. Uh, there was another one I went to with my wife. I can't remember the name of it right now off the top of my head, but it was an excellent, uh, excellent one. So, I mean, we enjoy doing that thing. But again, with COVID, we're in lockdown. We can't do that. They're not open. They're not going to allow people in anyway. So... Yeah, that does suck on that part. And watching them live, like I watched Hamilton on the Disney Plus uh, app, and it it would have been probably a lot better going there, like you said, to see that live than it was watching on TV. As good as it was on TV, it would have been that much better watching it live. I've had great experiences during this time watching comics on stream live on zoom or on other, and it feels very intimate and very unique, and I'm getting to watch them perform without laughter, so they're not judging themselves as harshly and they feel more free to just tell stories and speak from the heart. And I do like that, but it's a different thing. It's a different bit. It does help with the loneliness. It does help um, fulfill that kind of desire to connect, but it's a different bit than being in a club and seeing someone perform. So we'll see what happens. I'm optimistic. We'll find a way back. And I'm glad that Joe Biden was elected. And I feel like if anyone, he will at least pay some sort of attention to fixing that broken system of ours right now yeah and that's what it seems to be it seems to be the other one is not actually even paying attention to any of this and just wants to have more of lawsuits and trying to get stuff overturned and he's paying more attention to that than the actual people of the states and uh, it's a little bit frustrating at watching it from another country Uh, we don't know everything that's going on there but uh, from what we hear in the news that's just kind of depressing to see that yeah, I would say whatever you think is happening, it, it, it's yes, that's what's happening. The worst you yeah, can assume seems, is seems our right. reality. It's really yeah, like that. That seems about right. Yeah. 
There really are so Karens I wanna... in every grocery store. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into your acting a little bit, because there is something I want to touch on later on uh, in the recording that you had touched on during the opener of the convention as well. But let's get into just a bit, little bit about the acting. Um, what gave you that bug to start acting? I wanted to be a stand-up comic when I was a kid, and I was obsessed with the HBO comedy specials. And I would watch them as an eight-year-old, as a nine-year-old, and a ten-year-old. And at ten, I developed a stand-up act, and I started performing it at the library and at local talent shows. And there wasn't really a, a straight path for a ten-year-old comic, so it fell into acting. And I started auditioning for open calls and things. I lived not far from New York City, so I could get into that kind of stuff. And I auditioned for a Broadway play um, by Herb Gardner. It was an open call stood in line just like the COVID test for a couple hours in New York City. And I got, this was, I was about nine or 10 and I got down the line. I got a bunch of callbacks. I didn't get the part in the play, but the casting director, Meg Simon, told me that I should go to an acting school like Lee Strasberg. So I left her office and went to the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute on 14th Street and auditioned and signed up for classes and started taking those and started doing the films that people would advertise. They were casting on the wall there and commercials and just never really stopped. It was always something I wanted to do. It was always something I felt compelled to do. My folks loved the arts and they put actors and artists on a pedestal and I think I got it from them. They, you know, showed me theater at a very young age and cinema and encouraged my love of the arts. So I don't think it was a surprise to them that at such a young age, I really had the desire to do it professionally. I was always obsessed with, um, if we were at a play or a concert, like what was going on backstage? What was happening back there to make this thing happen? And I just always wanted to be a part of that in any capacity. And both my brothers felt the same calling and both work in talent and music management. Yeah, um, but getting into the acting, uh, once you did get into the acting, like I always wonder, you wondered what was going on backstage. I always wonder how an audition goes. So when you go for an audition to a show or uh, to to do a movie or a show or whatever you're you're trying out for, how do those work? Like you go in, you do the audition. Do they just say nope right away and you're gone if you're if you're if they don't like you, or is it just okay? I'm going to get a call back here and you're going to keep going and then you get another call back. Like how do those generally run? Well, I would say um, create a job that you need filled in your life. Like look at your life and go, well, I could really use a, a, a nanny or a, a cleaning person or I have a problem with my dishwasher and I could use someone to fix it and think in your mind how you would go about obtaining that person to fulfill that function for you. Come up with whatever that process might be and then do whatever the opposite of that is. And that is the auditioning for film or TV or theater process. It is unfortunately the worst way possible to find the person that you're looking for. It is a very convoluted system where people are pretty much just validating their own kind of useless job on your back. And Okay, let, let's put it like this. When um, Drake is on tour and he wants a horn section, I got a couple tunes with horns. I want a horn section to tour with me on this run. He will talk to his band leader or talk to the producer of his record and meet a horn person. He will find a, 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 a sectional leader. He'll find a trumpet player. And he'll say, these are the kind of arrangements I'm looking for. These are the charts I have. These are the songs. I want a trombone, a barry, a tenor, a trumpet, and an alto. Can you put that together for me? And I'll go, yeah. And that band leader will go hire five, six. And then they'll all rehearse together. He'll, Drake will hear the sounds and he'll go, great. Now, if this were an acting gig and we were to just replace the roles. What Drake would then have to do is ask every single trumpet player in town to come parade before him, play a very simple chart that they'll have very little time to work on, not on their own horn, but on a different horn, and just play these three notes in front of me uh, in Venice at 3 p.m. on this day, and then I will decide which one of you can do it, even though they all can do it. 
Does this make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. It's a little convoluted. Yeah. But it's unfortunately the worst way to cast whatever you're looking for is to make an actor show up at this time on this day with very little time to learn the lines and to perform it for them. If you've played the dad in 12 sitcoms and you can show them you playing the dad on these very successful sitcoms, they'll still ask you to come in and just be the dad in front of us with a mop. We're not going to give you a son. We're going to give you a mop. And we just want to see what a good dad you can be. Now, any trumpet player in town is going to say, fuck you, Drake. That's crazy. Here's all the tunes I've played on. Here are all my references. Here's my career. Do you want me to be the trumpet player on your tour or not? Why don't you decide? And if Drake said, no, what I want you to do is to show up at this point at this town on somebody else's trumpet and play a couple notes for me, they would say, go fuck yourself, Drake. But for some reason, because there's so many actors and so many people that want the job, they have just created this system that's more Olympic and athletic than it is creative. And you have to show up and work with a non-actor and somehow prove to them that you can do this thing that you've done many times before, but while standing on one leg and in front of uh, all of these people at this time. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Does it sound yeah, anything definitely. other than bitter? <laughs> no, not at all. Not okay. at all. Okay, good. I've no. just found as um, someone I've directed and I've produced and I've acted and I've been a lead and I've been background and I've done it all and I've, I've been the reader at auditions, the person that just reads with the actors who are coming in. I've done every part of this process and I can tell you it doesn't work. And it's very, very frustrating to constantly have to beat your head at this process that does not find you the best actor for this role and until casting directors and agents are realized to be this very antiquated non-functioning job they're going to have to validate their existence and they're going to have to keep holding these auditions covid is something that's actually helped with that a lot because everything has to be on self tape now so everything is a tape that you made yourself that you're sending in and when you have that kind of autonomy and control over it and you can actually if you're lucky work with another actor it's very helpful it's funny because any there's a famous saying acting is reacting and that's a very true statement you know you're reacting to your partner in real time and that's almost more important than what you are doing However, almost any audition you go on, you don't read with a real actor. You read with a casting director or usually a casting assistant who is an intern. So you're reading with someone who has no experience and no ability to react. And they are causing you to react to nothing. I mean, this is a, a scene where I'm more talking to and saying goodbye to my dying father and you're having me read with a 15-year-old girl. And me proving that I can make this 15-year-old girl my father might be Olympian and heroic, but it's not what it's going to be on the day. It's not going to be how you shoot it in real life. So why do we have to do this to prove that to you? It's very interesting. It's a very, very broken system that hopefully will be fix soon because I'm very passionate about how much it really does weed out a lot of the best actors and you can see how people get cast that oh yeah they're not really good at this role but I bet they were good at auditioning for it and I bet they were good at these little tricks that needed to be done to get past that part but they're actually not very good at the role at all you see that a lot and you're like how did that happen it happened because they were good at the audition on that day doesn't mean they're a good actor, and it doesn't mean that they're going to kill it in the role. Does that make any sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and see, this is the stuff that we don't know, right? We don't know this behind the scene thing. We don't know the audition. We see the finished product, and we can either rate, hey, you know what? Yes, that was a good actor or terrible actor. And, and case in point, I, we just finished watching The Flight Attendant. I don't know if you've watched that at all. I haven't seen it. Um, so uh, that's with Kaylee Cuoco uh, from Big Bang Theory. And, you know, she's a good actor. The, 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 the show was really good. But all I kept seeing was Penny. And that's all I kept seeing in the show. And it was like, I can't get over the Penny thing. Um, because I know she kind of got typecast in that role. 
And now she went into this more of a dramatic role. And it was like, it's Penny, it's Penny, it's Penny, it's Penny. And that's all I saw through the whole thing. So we don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Like we, like I said, we see the finished product, whereas you know more about the stuff that goes on with the auditions and, and everything else that goes on behind it. Well, let me put it like this. You've heard of um, scouts that go looking for baseball players. They troll the minor leagues and they're looking for someone who pitches well. If they see someone with a good arm and someone who's like, really throwing heat and they get excited about them. They want to meet with them. They want to talk to them. They want to see them pitch in different scenarios, but at no point are they like, I want to pitch with them. I want to play catch with them because I would like to see what it's like when I try and hit off them. You'd be like, well, you're not a professional ball player. So why is you playing catch with this ball player going to be any judge of whether they can throw or not. Why don't you put them with a professional ball player and watch them go back and forth? Then you could tell. No other profession allows the casting person or the scout to insert themselves into the process like that. But for some reason, we accept it with actors. For some reason, it's okay with actors. There seems to be a thing where what actors do is uh, magic and some kind of mystery and some kind of untenable thing that you just kind of stay out of the way from, try and not fuck up and just let them do their thing until they dig themselves into a hole and we have to get them out. But the truth is acting is a process and there is a method and it is a muscle like anything else. It's no different than playing guitar or singing or pitching a ball. It is a muscle that you can work, you can get out of shape, you can get in shape, but it's always best if you're um, playing trumpet with another instrument or if you're playing catch with another ball player or if you're acting with another actor. It's always best. If I'm going to have real actors when we shoot this gig, why am I speaking to a tennis ball right now? Right, right. And, and see, like you learn certain little tricks about acting. So when you're doing a, a set on a show that you're on, uh, you've learned over the years, either in acting school or whether it's while you're doing your acting, never to look at the camera. Like I have a hard time looking at the camera when I'm doing a podcast only because I have so many things going on. I'm looking at notes. I'm looking over here and make sure the lighting's OK. Is the microphone not going to get knocked over? I always look at the camera whenever I'm being filmed. And there's always that like brief, you know, split second where you take a look at the camera. And is that something that you learn more in acting school that you have to pretend that the camera isn't there? Or is that just something you pick up along the way while you're while you're actually acting in different shows or whatever you're doing? Both things. You learn it from both process. And I'll say that in we grew up with televisions since we were babies. There were screens. And I don't know if you've noticed little kids today, you hand them a phone or anything and they assume it's a touch screen. They adapt to this yeah. stuff so quickly. And I know if I'm at a bar or I'm somewhere and there's a TV on, even if it's playing something I have no interest in, my eye can't stop just glancing over there. It's what we do when we see that screen. So if you're ever in front of a camera and it's not a normal thing for you to do, it is completely natural for you to be just, that's what our eyes do. We're trained to go there. And like any other muscle, if you are working on something and you are working on making this person in front of you someone from your past, and you're working on confessing your real sins to this person from your past that you're putting on this other actor, you're not concerned with the screen. You're just work looking at them and you're just focused on them. And along the same lines, if um, you've done it enough, I know I accidentally look at the camera sometimes, especially if it like is moving, you can't help it. When you're looking this way and something comes across it, you're gonna look at it. It takes practice. But over time, you'll learn how to do that. You know, you'll learn very easily how to do that. You'll learn very easily how to be like, oh, you're standing there, but it's better for the eye line if I look here. So I'm going to look here, but I'm going to talk to you, but I'm going to look here. I'm going to look down. I'm not going to look back up at you. I'm going to look at this little part of the screen. They're muscles. And the more you do them, the easier it gets. And it's a skill and you can learn it over time. And anyone can learn it. Just like anyone can learn to sing. Anyone can learn how to do that. You know, it's such an awkward thing in any musical you've ever seen when someone goes from speaking to singing it's always uncomfortable you do it enough and you can make it a little more organic you can make it a little more natural you just practice it enough and you can tap into that thing that says okay well words aren't working anymore so am i going to try fists no i'll try singing 
which is kind of like screaming because these words aren't working. So I have to try something else because I'm just trying to reach you. And maybe if I just hold out my voice and now I'm singing a song and there we go. If you can motivate it and make it real, the audience will go along with you. If we're aware of that insecurity you have, we'll be less likely to jump on that journey with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And really it's yeah. a muscle that you can work and acting is no different than any other skill that you can practice and work. And there are exercises you can do and methods you can follow that will show you'll show improvement over time and you'll become a better and better actor. It's not mystery. It's not magic. Certain people have a certain charm and a certain, um, just quality. And that is great too. And that is a form of acting, but it's a different thing. Do you know what I mean? That's a star quality. That's an attraction. That's a charm. And that's a different thing than an actor. You know, an actor is very different than a newscaster. But that's a great skill. I think newscasting is a great skill, but I don't think you want to see Robert De Niro read the news because... No. No, and he's the greatest actor living. But I don't know him reading the news would seem, he'd seem kind of uncertain and kind of... It just is It's a different skill. And I don't think Mike Wallace can do what De Niro does, and I don't think De Niro can do what Mike Wallace does. That's a different skill. Looking at the camera and making it a person, like a YouTuber, that's a skill. And not every actor has that. And not every YouTuber is an actor. It's amazing. I, I did a gig with YouTubers for a while, and I was always in awe of their ability to just look at the camera and make that camera their best friend. They could do it. They just look at the camera, and they're like, hey, friends, and you believe them. I I can't do that. I don't have that skill. I look at the camera. I inherently make everyone uncomfortable. It's just what I do. I've accepted that. But I learned, oh, shit. And they're really bad at reading lines on a paper. You ask them to just look at the camera and make it a person, and you just believe they're talking to their best friend. They have this ease, this natural simpatico with this lens that I can't create, but you give them a script and they're stiff and they're uncomfortable. And I'm the same way when he asked me to talk to the camera. I'm like, I am looking at a camera and I'm talking to the camera, but you give me a script and I can hide and I can bury and I can find that stuff and I can make it come alive for you. They're separate but equal skills. Yeah, and I, it, I'm starting to get used to it because I started doing live streaming uh, about August. And it was the first time that I started doing it. And, you know, I was all over the place when I first started and it was more the webcam was focused down um, below on my laptop screen and I had a bigger screen up top where I could see the guest and, you know, everything was all over the place. I was like, I didn't have it set up properly. So my wife was like, you look distracted all the time. You're looking down, you're looking up, you're looking over here, you're looking at your notes over here, do a split screen here. And I was like, I'm new to this. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. So I'm giving it a try. And, and eventually you get a little bit better at it. And with the conventions being online a lot and being on live streams, it's helped a lot. Like you said, it's like muscle memory. It's just basically practice going over and doing it over and over and over again. So it's kind of worked out that way. Yeah, I'm really glad because that's what I have to do now. Like I'm talking to you and there's an image of me to my right. What could be more distracting than myself looking at me, waving, saying, look over here, look over here. Your fly's probably yeah. open. You got a booger hanging out of your nose. Did you brush your hair back? What are you, that's, that's all going. But I got to ignore it and just focus on you and have a conversation yeah. with this person like I would if we were at a coffee house. Yeah. And, and uh, mine's the same way, like right out of my peripheral vision here, I see myself and I can see my hand waving and it's, it, it is a little bit distracting, but see, you're more used to that than I am. So, uh, I'm still getting used to that kind of eyeline. Like you were talking about for acting, for the tapes you make at home as auditions for what you shoot. It's everything where you're looking in your eye is whether you're going to get the gig or not. And I have a pastime of looking up great auditions on YouTube. I love looking up auditions. And eyeline is such a part of that, where you're looking, how far from the camera, whether you're looking directly at it or next to it, or at, it's all ways in. And it takes a lot of time. I went through two different configurations just for this, of moving the mic wow. and the screen. And then, oh no, let me put the screen back there, the mic here, that's better, because otherwise I'll be like this. It took a while and I realized, oh, I'm not going to be comfortable if I'm like that the whole time. It'll sound good, but I'm not going to. So I have to get it higher. It takes some pre pre preparation. But once you yeah. get it down, you've got it. There's a, a video I recommend anybody watch. And I'm not even a fan of the guy, but it's such a great audition. It's Russell Brand auditioning for Forgetting Sarah Marshall. 
Just search that in the YouTube and you're gonna see a brilliant method example of improvisational acting. And so much about it is just where he's looking. When he's looking at the person he's talking to, when he's painting a picture for them, and he's looking this way, and you just believe he's seeing everything he's describing. The way he comes up behind her and speaks to her like this, and then comes up on the other side, and the fact that it's all improv, you can see how they were like, oh, give this guy the role. And he's working with no one. He's working with a casting assistant. You can see she contributes nothing. She helps him by being a body that is there for him to speak to and that's it she barely offers and he's like i don't even need your words it's all in my head just watch me go i think that is a brilliant example of that olympian thing it takes to win an audition sometimes and he does it masterfully in that another one i love is um hugh laurie's audition for house you can watch that on youtube it's obviously he just sent in some camcorder video of a script he'd read once and was not even that into. And he, he reads these lines, it's about two pages, he has, he's looking down at it, you can see the other person speaks, he's looking at his line, what's my line, here's my line to you, then back down. But when it's done, and he says the last line, he does this little look where he's just like, that was pretty good. He's just kind of pleased with himself. And then the camera goes dark, and you're like, that's what got him the role. It wasn't anything he read. It was the minimal amount of effort he put in. And then that smug kind of like, yep, nailed it. That's House. Like, that's the character. And that's the character that got the role and that you end up seeing in the next however many seasons of that show it ran. So just allowing there to be some kind of pocket where we can have these real human experiences, luckily or hopefully on camera, in focus, into the microphone while it's live, and that's all we're looking for, right? I mean, we'd give anything for that, just to have a little human, real reaction in this time. And to yeah. share that moment with someone, that's all we're looking for. And if you can capture that, then you've won. Yeah, definitely. So I, I did have a question from Sarah, and she wanted to know, I guess, what was your favorite, I guess, acting gig that you've done? Um, what was your favorite film that you either film or television whatever you did what was your favorite i don't have a favorite gig i mean there are moments of each gig that are the best and the worst and they happen with all of them and i've had those moments on every gig there's a part of every scene i've shot that i think is oh that's my best moment and then one i wouldn't want anyone to see <laughs> And they coexist all the time. I can tell you, um, I shot a thing in Toronto once that was, uh, no, I'm sorry, Vancouver. It was Vancouver. And it was, uh, we were shooting indoors for outdoors, which meant it was a soundstage the size of a football field. And it was all indoors. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of background actors. And it was raining indoors. And I did a scene very close to camera. The camera is right here. And I step in front of it. I order a coffee to the person behind the camera. They give me my coffee. I thank them. I have a little conversation with the person next to me. And then I walk off. Now the scene stays with the person I was talking to. And they have a new conversation with a new person that steps in. But while they're having that conversation, you can see me behind them walking for the entirety of the scene because it's such a large set and it goes on for like five minutes and you can see me walking with an umbrella through this crowd and these people bumping into me and I remember shooting that scene and then turning around and walking out and having those five minutes of walking away and thinking this is just real life like this is not acting it's raining there's people bumping into me at this point I'm so far back in the mix of the scene, you can still see me on camera, but none of these background actors know that I was just in the scene. They assume I'm background with them, so everyone's just bumping into me and everyone's just trying to get out of the rain. And it was just such a full on 360 sensorial experience that I did not have to work in any way. All I had to do was just exist and live and say these lines and turn around and walk off. And I could go in any direction too. And I'd still be on camera. And it was the director's smart decision to keep me in the back, knowing that 
I could get really far and still be in the shot. That was just such a surreal out of body experience to know in this moment, I'm like in a live video game. This is what it must be like to play Last of Us or just look around at this world and go, I can do whatever I want in this moment and not be held accountable. And it's all justified. And I wonder what I'll do. Of course, what I did was not much, but it was an incredible feeling. Um, especially every time they yell cut and the rain would stop and I'd go back to the beginning and just know that I had this long walk waiting for me where I could just do whatever I wanted. It was on a TV show called Altered Carbon. And, um, the director had done a bunch of episodes of The Wire, which was my favorite. So I loved the shot that she planned. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but it was fun. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so what, what was your favorite, uh, I guess, kind of, uh, genre to work in? Do you prefer more working in the dramatic role or do you prefer more working in the comedic role? I love it all. I really do. There's great moments and great things to find in all of it. I don't have a preference. I don't think there's much of a difference between doing comedy and drama. Usually the most honest way you can say the line is also the funniest. So that kind of coincides or meets right there. So I like for there to not be that much of a difference in the comedy as for the drama. I've always been a sucker for hour long TV shows. I love working on them. I just do. I just love that procedural process. A lot of people hate it. They find it mind numbing. I love it. I feel like, especially when I go to Canada or somewhere, my passport says alien with special skills. And I feel so proud of that. I'm an alien with special skills. I come here to share them with you and (laughs) I get to experience something and then it's done and the scene is done. You know, on sitcoms and a lot of things, you're working on the same scene Monday that you're still working on Friday and there might be reshoots for it on Monday. So you never quite get that like, it's a laugh. So they're always like, could the laugh be bigger? Could the laugh be, I bet it could be bigger. Maybe we can make it bigger. But there's something about um, when you go inside and when it's making people cry or making them feel something where they go, oh, I got that lump in my throat. We got it, let's move on. And I really like that feeling of accomplishment. When it's done, we did that scene the best it could be done for whatever it's worth. And now we're moving on. I like that feeling a lot. See, I I really enjoyed uh, watching you in Men at Work. Uh, I could watch that show over and over again. I I thought that show was hilarious. You were fantastic in it, Uh, as was Gibbs. Uh, He was really good in it as well. Uh, How are you guys uh, with working together? How is that cast to work with? I know there are things that we can't really talk about, but um, how is that cast working with? Anything you like. But I can say if there was any success in that show, it was that we all really were friends. And we still are. And we all really dug hanging out with each other. And we really did. We were just such a tight unit. It was so much fun to go to work every day with your friends. And if I could crack them up, I knew I'd done something well. Do you know what I mean? That was a a real joy. Especially with James, who you're talking about, um, who played Gibbs, who is the best. And we still remain friends. And we still see each other whenever we can. And we genuinely, we were such different guys from such different backgrounds with such different lives that we all loved each other was a real um, testament to Brecken's casting and his vision, I think. But it was just a simple sitcom about guys that like hanging out with each other. And I learned a lot because when I was 10 or 11 and first went to Strasbourg as a kid, you know, a lot of what you do is about suffering for the audience. (laughs) And how you can suffer and feel these things for them. That's what the artist's job is. The the artist's job is, like Lenny Bruce said, is like the deviant's job. It's to be on the front lines and to feel and experience these things so you don't have to. That's what our job is. I'm out there feeling all the pain and all the horror of this, whatever situation is, and then reliving it so you don't have to. So hopefully someone who's felt something similar in their life can see that and go, oh, I feel validated. The human test. There it is. Okay. It's okay to feel that bad. It's okay to suffer like that. I've done that. Now I feel better. That's what we hope for. But I learned on that gig in the sitcom world, it was something they would whisper to me every once in a while when I needed it, which is that it's not so bad if your friends are there with you. So just remember that no matter how bad, you know, in the scene we'd be doing, my girlfriend broke up with me in the scene. So I'm miserable. And they'd come over and be like, yeah, yeah, you're miserable. But 
it's not as bad as it could be because your friends are here. So let's focus on the fact that your friends are here. And it took me a while to get into that groove and be like, oh yeah, that's right. It's not so bad because your friends are here. And we are, to the audience, those friends. So it's not so bad because we're not alone. We're all sharing in it together. Yeah, and I really wish that show would have continued because I, I, I actually really enjoyed it. I'm not just saying it because you're on the show. Um, we actually just watched it uh, a couple nights ago. I, I, the show was just great. It just I get the comedic humor of it. Uh, I really got the story of it. I, I just really, really enjoyed watching it. It was definitely, um, when it worked best, it was Breckenmeyer's vision just streamlined because he's got a weird sense of humor and a weird perspective that I really love. And when that weirdness could get streamlined, it was the best. It really was something special. Yeah. Okay, so I want to touch on something that you talked about in the convention. Actually, you wanted to talk to Sarah about more because uh, she has a true crime uh, podcast. This is and, Chris Watts. Uh, something of a... This is Chris Watts. Um, you went down a little bit of a, a, a rabbit hole with this. And we don't want to get too much into it because I want to save some of that because you said you'd uh, talk with Sarah about it. Um, but uh, let's talk just a little bit about it and tell me what you think of it. I mean, what I think of it is that I have a really unhealthy obsession with it. And it's not the kind of topic you can just bring up in normal conversation because it makes people very uncomfortable. And rightly so. And I really do have a desire to talk about this case with someone that is also as invested in it, but it's hard to find and it's certainly hard to bring up in mixed company. So I was just very excited when she mentioned her obsession with it because I'm always down to talk about it. It just, you know, you sound crazy. I sound crazy when I talk about it. I've tried different voices too and different deliveries of it and, and real cool detached kind of deliveries of it but it's still it's just um it's just hard to um wrap my mind around what happened there and i have a lot of unanswered questions and more info keeps getting released and keeps getting released and it just feeds into this uh mental spiral i've been doing about this man who suddenly got up one day and killed his entire family and buried it and thought he was going to get away with it <laughs> Yeah, it, it it was just you you guys started talking about it on the podcast convention and and it didn't register in my mind and I was like, you know, we got off and and I was like, "Oh my god, they're talking about that Netflix doc that we just watched." And we had watched it maybe 2-3 days beforehand and had no idea that we were going to be discussing it. So the name didn't kind of register in my head when you guys started talking about it. And then afterwards I I went back and I was like, "Ah, oh, that's the one. That's the one that they were talking about." So what did you think of that, having seen that documentary? What do you think? Uh, it was disturbing. It was mm -hmm. very disturbing to see what other human beings can do. And, and we have a Netflix account that, if you looked into it, would be disturbing because it's all serial killer documentaries. And that's all we watch. You watch the Ted Bundy ones. You watch this American Murderer one. You know, any documentary that has to do with serial killers, we're on it. We want to watch it. We want to see what's going on. We want to hear that point of the story because, you know, you have to realize it's always from one point of view, whoever's directing it, or whoever's telling the story of that uh, typical or um, specific uh, show. Um, no different than you have um, a Michael Moore documentary. It's his point of view. Uh, it's nobody else's. It's their point of view. So it was interesting to see this one. And just see everything that had happened because I don't know if it made a big story in the U.S. We didn't hear about this story here uh, until I saw the documentary. Like it wasn't big news here. And then we saw it and we were just like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable of what happened. Well, what's interesting, is, I don't know if you noticed, but that Netflix documentary you watched is entirely found footage. Yes. There's nothing that was shot for the doc. Everything is stuff that, for some reason, the Colorado PD released. And I don't know of any other case where you can, from, the, from before, from hours before this man commits murder to the following two days until he ends up in prison, 
you can watch almost every single hour of that time in real time. And that's just a crazy experience. And I was not a true crime junkie before this case, but this case really tipped me over into that world. And now I've explored many other cases since then, and I'm still obsessed with this one. There's just something about the fact that you can watch all of it in real time up until the moment the prison guard goes, Mr. Watts, come with me. And he goes into his cell. And then the pre-trial, oh, not trial, but then the pre-hearing and then the sentencing and then another follow-up conversation that they do with him once he's in Wisconsin prison. And now the little bits of phone calls with his family that they're still releasing, like it doesn't end. And I can't stop watching all of it. And I don't know if it's simply because of the amount of um, footage that they've released or if it's the nature of the case and the fact that we'll never know why or how because there was no trial. Because he just said, I didn't do it, but I'm going to plead guilty anyway, so I'll do the time, bye. And we'll talk about it when. What happened? What happened there? What convinced this man to, who has no history of violence, no history of profanity, no instance of anything like this in his life turned to such drastic measures to fix the problems in his life and then think he's going to get away with it. To yeah. think he's going to well, get I did away a little with bit, it. I did a little bit of reading on it and there was so much that just, you know, just way too much material to even keep up with uh, mm -hmm. regarding this case. And they have um, somebody that came out and said that he was in a relationship with a male escort uh, the mother has actually come out and confirmed that he was in this relationship with uh, the other girlfriend uh, before the murders happened. He, he's been in multiple relationships, so he was trying to start a new life. They were having money troubles. Uh, he just wanted everything to start over. And then it just all came to a plan where obviously the plan didn't work out. But, you know, you you kept saying that it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me until your dad came in. And then all of a sudden that's kind of where the beans spilled in the interrogation room with the father. Which is the penultimate moment in for any actor, for any musician, for any songwriter. It's that you're railing against the injustices of the world. Or is it really just about your father? Is it about 9-11? Is it about getting Osama? Is it about this horrible world traits? Or is it about your father? in your father's war. What is it about? So yeah, when he's like, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Can you talk to your father for a second? He's like, dad, I did it. What happened there? What happened? It is so universal, universal. It is It is so um relatable, like a little kid who's holding on to this lie and then you bring their mother in and they're like, mom, I did it. What happened? Did he do it? Did he not? How did he think we, he was going to get away with it? The fact that his wife just was a little late to a phone call she had in the morning. So her friend called the cops. Her friend, her next door neighbor who was supposed to meet her that morning was like, hmm, my friend's a little late. She's not picking up her phone. I'm just going to call the cops. That thing you never do. That thing that you're like, I'm just going to give them a couple hours. She did. And because she did it, they caught the killer, her husband. It's incredible. It really is. Trent Bolte, the gay love affair you're talking about, that was dismissed. But the affair he was having with Nicole Kessinger, that was real. He was really yeah. having an affair with this woman at work for a couple of weeks. And that because there's no trial, she just disappeared. He goes into prison and everyone goes, all right, we did our job. And you're like, wait, we're all left here with so many questions, so many unanswered questions. I'm glad it's... um getting some traction in Canada and other places due to that Netflix doc, because it's, it's, if you can watch that footage in real time, it's quite incredible to watch this man. I mean, just as an actor to see somebody lying so poorly and doing all of the signals of, of, of lying and doing, he didn't know that a, a polygraph test is not admissible in court. He didn't yeah. know that. They questioned him for two days straight. And at any point, he can say, you know what, I would like a lawyer. Or, you know what, I'm done. But he never does. Is it because he's stupid? Or is it because he thinks he's smarter than everyone else? I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know. But or did he want to eventually get caught? 
Or was he looking to get caught because of guilt? I don't know. To get caught, he get caught because of guilt. Yeah, I don't know. But it's he's been in prison for about two years now, and he's just starting to be like, I don't like this. I don't like this prison. I really want to get out. I wish I hadn't have pleaded guilty. I wish I hadn't have pled guilty. This is bad. So we'll see where it goes. Because my guess is he's going to start throwing everyone under the bus, start giving a lot more interviews, doing a lot more press, and just trying to get attention. Because he's he's in his mid thirties, and he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah. Like he's got multiple he got three life sentences, right? Yeah, and consecutive, meaning they have to be done one after the other. He killed his wife. He killed two children and an unborn child. And he speaks See, about and it. And life sentences there are different, right? What are your life sentences there? Uh, it, it, it's until you die. There's See, no ours year are 25 years. Yeah, we don't have that. So he's never getting out. But he's found religion. He found Jesus. And he's very much hiding under that cloak and speaking only with, you know, religious terminology and saying he's found God and he speaks of the tragedy. He never says that he did it, which is very telling because the language is a big deal. As long as he's surrounded by people who let him use those pronouns, it will remain a tragedy and not a thing he did. Yeah. And, and Sarah will actually go into detail you, with you on this because she this is this is right up her alley. Uh, she really please tell her really, to reach really out to me. I haven't heard from her. Stuff. I would love to talk to her about it. Yes. Oh yes, a hundred percent. She's uh she was like, okay, don't worry, you have something booked with him. I'll wait till you're done with him, and then I'll uh, I'll contact him. So she is going to contact you for sure. Can't wait. Um, but there is another one that you should check out if you haven't already, and it's called Don't Fuck with Cats, and mm-hmm. that's on Netflix as well. If you haven't checked that one out, that's a pretty disturbing one as well. That's that's what I feel like <laughs> with the Chris Watts case. I feel like the way they were with that case, where you're just. Well, that box of chocolate is from a different country, so I'm going to check, yeah, all of that. Like, just obsessing over those kind of details. And they did a lot of good, that group. They did a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of good in finding out who really did it and not accepting what they were told. So I, I respect that a lot. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up here. So if there are, is there, is there anything that you want to say to anybody? Is there, are there any projects that you're currently working on that you want to uh, let out right now? Share your socials, whatever you want to do right now. Um, well, I've been working on a, a horror anthology called Frank, made by um, Chrissy Fox and Spider One um, from Power Man 5000. That's a really great horror anthology. And it's the only second gig I've done during this, covid time and it was inspiring to see how well people can keep to protocols when they're asked to and how everyone can be completely separate and i had another the one actress i worked with doing my makeup and hair and we would you know be quarantined together and the amount of tests we took and how isolated we were and how separated we were from everyone it it did give me hope that working under these conditions is possible and people are taking it seriously. They're not just pretending. They're not just showing up at work and going, okay, now we got the green light to work. Let's just do whatever we want. They are keeping to these things and it is possible to work and never come within six feet of someone unless it's the one actor you're working with. It is possible. And I'm, I'm glad to see that they're doing it. So I'm excited to see how that film turns out. It's called Frank. It's made by Chrissy Fox. Okay, very nice. And uh, do you want to share any of your socials uh, for anybody to follow you on Instagram, Twitter, anywhere like that? Sure. If anyone wants to um, follow me on Adam Bush, B-U-S-C-H on Twitter or Reagan.com on the Instagram. I call it Reagan.com because um, do you have Rush Limbaugh there? Do you know who that is? No, we know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he has a scam where he sells uh, email addresses to senior citizens who don't know that email is free. And it's under the address Reagan.com. You can have your name really? at Reagan.com with all the trust that Ronald Reagan brings to the Internet. So for the low, low price of $40 a month, you can have an email address, Grandpa, at Reagan.com. And you can be uh, comfortable knowing your email is as secure as Ronald Reagan. And he's just selling something that's free to senior citizens, which is just cruel. So I called myself Reagan.com spelled out to just be like, you know, anyone can be Reagan.com. You don't have to charge them, charge them $40 a month for that. So I was going to ask uh, you about that. I totally slipped my mind. So thank you for bringing that up because I was going to ask you about that. 
Oh, yeah, that's the only reason I called it that. And since my last name is Bush, I thought it was somehow maybe a play on words somewhere to someone. (laughs) All right. So I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today. Uh, We really appreciate it. Um, You're always welcome to come on. You ever want to come back on again, you're more than welcome to come back on. Uh, We had a great time, great conversation. If you do still talk to James, I'd love to get him on the show as well. Uh, interesting guy that I seem to like to to get to talk to. Oh, I will uh, definitely still talk. To- I will definitely send him the message. I'm sure he would love to. He's a great guy to talk to, and you're doing great work here. I really appreciate all the efforts you're doing and keeping people connected during this time. You're doing a great job at it, and it means a lot to all of us out there. So I'd be happy to come back anytime you have any questions for me. I love talking to you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. And as always, stay safe, be kind to each other, and we will see you later. Don't trust anyone with wooden nickels.